wonderful opportunity for us to deep dive into a number of very important subjects, such as the global road to recovery. Now, this year has been one fraught with concerns over the coronavirus pandemic, and no matter where you are in the world, you have certainly been touched by it. We're going to look at the road to recovery now, and particularly the prospects for SMEs from two perspectives, one from the policy makers' side, and the other from an economist's side when it comes to economic policy. Uh, so I'm going to be moderating two fireside chats now. The first with Mareed McGuinness, who is the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, and then distinguished economist Dr. Raghuram Rajan, who is the professor of the at the University of Chicago Booth School, will be speaking to us after that. And like I said, we're going to take a deeper look into that road to recovery for global economies, um, but with a special focus on SMEs, because we're talking about 50% of global GDP. So two sessions back to back looking at the same topic from two sides. So let's get cracking, shall we? And we can check in with Mareed uh, McGuinness, Commissioner Mareed McGuinness, who is the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, who I believe is joining us from Brussels. Commissioner McGuinness, I hope that you can hear us. Thank you and thank you for the welcome. Um, I hope you're hearing me. We certainly are. We certainly are. Great to have you with us. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Uh, I, okay, wanted to well. just, <laughs> I wanted to start off, though, um, just finding out how you are coping with the pandemic over there. I've been checking up on the news. Uh, we know that cases in, in Belgium are beginning to fall, which is great news, but a large number of fatalities. How's everything going? Well, I suppose like many uh, countries, um, COVID has hit different member states of the European Union in different ways. I recall leaving Brussels last March to travel back to my member state, I, I'm, I'm Irish, and thinking it might be three weeks and I would be back to normal. But of course, that has not happened. So I think two things um, have emerged from this. Firstly, um, how short-sighted the world was around preparing for a pandemic. And then we've come into a second wave, which we're now coping with. And the situation, as you reference in Belgium was quite difficult, but now the uh, case numbers are reducing because we were trying to make sure that the hospitals were not overloaded. The same across the European Union, but we are by no means in control of this pandemic. And I think the lesson, if anyone asks me for 2020, is that the world really needed to prepare better and not just see this as a one-off, but maybe learn lessons from this pandemic as to how we invest in public health, how we as citizens behave if we are asked to do certain things, and maybe make us take uh, less for granted the things that we took for granted of normal life, of visiting, of shopping, of meeting people. All of those normalities were removed from us. Our freedoms had to be curtailed. So I think now as we approach the Christmas and into the new year, we're really taking stock. And I think from the perspective of the European Commission, where I now sit, we are looking towards making sure that the world, first of all, is prepared to deal with vaccination. And this is good news, but also prepared to recover, because there will be a time lag between um, vaccination and recovery. And I think our focus now is maintaining our absolute, uh, if you like, will and intention to do everything to protect public health and lives, and also then look at economic well-being and try to make sure that we at least um, hold those businesses that can survive by supporting them, but maybe look at sectors that really will have difficulty coming back to the way they were, because so much has changed in a short few months. And I think it is only when we stop and take a breath to realize the enormity of what the world is currently going through and how profoundly changed we all are. I mean, in, in this building here, and indeed it, as my role as a member of the European Parliament, we hugged all the time. It was a normal hello. We, you know, shook hands or we give each other a greeting. And now we are running away from people. And even in my office today, there are very few staff because we are all protecting their health and their well-being. So it's a very different time. I'm speaking to you on a video link. All of my work is now done in this format. Sometimes the technology lets us down, but 
you know, today it worked, so I'm pleased about that. Oh, so are we, so are we, because otherwise we wouldn't be having this conversation. And, you know, something that we've experienced here in Singapore, particularly with the FinTech Festival, has been that we are reaching people all over the world. We're reaching them 24 hours a day for five days this week. That wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't leveraged or been forced to leverage the technology the way that we have. I understand from the people who support you in your office that this is your, your first big international engagement in your new role. So I have to say, we're really privileged. How's it feeling? Well, thank you. And I'm very privileged to take part in what is an enormous global event. Um, and I suppose by way of background, I mentioned my role in the European Parliament. So I come from your background. I was a journalist from 1980 right up to 2004, worked in, in all branches of media from television to radio and print. And then I often say that I took a rush of blood to the head, which is how one sometimes makes very profound decisions by running for uh, the European Parliament elections in 2004. And I I've been re-elected four times um, and I was first vice president of the parliament up until September, October of this year. And then I was nominated to fill the position as Irish commissioner um, and I'm here. So in a sense, I'm speaking to you very new, um, full of energy, full of enthusiasm for what is a really pivotal role. And I think what we will now understand is the road to recovery is not just going to be run by financial institutions, but it will be run in a more holistic way. So a great deal of my work currently is around sustainable finance, around the digital and green transformation, and that encompasses uh, the financial system at its very core. So I think I'm honoured and privileged to take over this role where we're looking at financial stability and capital markets union at a time of great change when we can, if you like, shape the change in a way that doesn't overwhelm us, but rather that we can be in control of it. I should say, and indeed we may discuss this, that uh, in this very building today we have have very, very difficult negotiations underway on Brexit, where our teams from the UK and the United Kingdom, or rather the EU and the United Kingdom, are sitting down to try and resolve some very, very difficult issues. So in a way, I'm speaking to you at a very historic time, troubling in many ways, full of opportunities in others, but a way in which the interconnectedness of all of us has really been brought home because of the circumstances in which we are living and working due to this pandemic. So, uh, as I say, I'm relatively new in the task, but I've had long experience of uh, work in the parliament and understanding how Europe works. And perhaps just very simply for your audience who may not just be as tuned in to the European Union, we are 27, as you know, the United Kingdom has left. We were 28. We have a commission that I'm in today where we uh, draft policy on all um, areas, but we obviously work with co-legislators. So the European Parliament are directly elected from all member states, over 720 members, and then the European Council, which is the body that represents the member states at ministerial level. So we have a, a very democratic system. It can be complicated and sometimes it takes more time, but it is how the European Union has evolved and evolved from a time in the past when countries in Europe were fighting. And today we are now at peace and we want to maintain that. And we are trying to be stronger together economically and socially and environmentally. So it's an exciting time to be in this role, but I don't underestimate the challenges that I also face. Certainly true. And you mentioned Brexit there, which I don't want to dwell on in any way, but we know that, that those talks are at a stage where fishing rights are getting in the way of actually making, getting to a conclusion. Uh, speaking of sectors that we focus on, I know that you have a background in the agricultural sector. Um, something has been made in the press of the fact that financial services isn't necessarily something new to you, but uh, it's something that will definitely have a steep learning curve. But is it useful to be outside the ecosystem system a little bit to have a bit of a better perspective. Hello. Hello. Oh, are we having Hello? some technical difficulties with Commissioner McGuinness? Hello. Potentially. Okay. Hello. Well, while we get across... Sorry, I, I can hear you again. Just you can. Apologies, but the, the line just broke down. Can you hear me now? I can definitely hear you. Hopefully you can hear okay. me. Okay. <laughs> wow. This is very stressful. Just, I, I heard your, your comment there. My background, as you say, is agricultural economics, um, and I'm very proud of that background. I think people who come from the land understand the basics of all um, living things and also of finance, because you live and die by what you produce. Um, but interestingly enough, one of my very first committees that I chaired in part 
Parliament was into the demise of a company, um, a life insurance company that left many um, uh, policyholders across Europe in a very difficult way. And I managed through that work to understand the system and also to get compensation from the United Kingdom government for those policyholders. So I, I think that the key um, issue and the key ask in this role is not an expert. I'm surrounded by experts, but an inquiring mind. And you know, I think you will understand this as a journalist and commentator that very often it is the basic questions that are never asked that yield the most information. And I'm never shy of asking very basic questions of everything that we do here. And fundamentally, what I want answers to is firstly, that what we are doing is helpful to SMEs, because this is what we're discussing today, and also to individuals as investors uh, and potential investors that we protect but also support. Um, and I have to say thus far, um, I'm, as I said, surrounded by people with great expertise. I found that, uh, if you like, political and the expert levels work very well together. Um, and I hope that that will continue into the future. I couldn't agree more with this idea that it's just when you ask those basic questions that no one asks uh, that you get some really important and very insightful answers. So I hope that I can ask a basic question now. Okay. And, and it's over the fact that you just mentioned, you know, 27 member nations. There is this perception that you're dealing with a very fragmented bunch. How do you get them all on board? OK, well, the sound is breaking a little, but let me just answer the question about how we get everyone on board. There's no doubt we have 27 member states that are all different culturally, language, etc. But I don't see that as the problem, because essentially what we do here, and, and to some extent it is a miracle that it works, is we, we, we talk through. So we propose, the European Parliament amends, the member states you know, also change parts of legislation, and then we all sit down at a table, whatever the issue is and we reach a compromise and I suppose in today's world um, the art of compromise has been downgraded so in other words we've come from a, a number of years of strong men demanding insisting only listening to their own perspective here in Europe no one is in control which means everyone has control so your my ideas as a when I was in the European Parliament one of a very small number of Irish MEPs once I used my voice and my knowledge effectively and respectfully, I could yield change. So in a way, while you would from the outside perceive this to be quite complicated, um, it certainly is. But at its core, all negotiation, all agreements, all unions are formed on the basis that people listen to each other disagree and then find a solution. And I'm never put off by that. I mean, I'm sometimes worried when there isn't a disagreement because I think that overly uh, consensual ideas are not always the best. So it is really to be judged not by the disagreement, but by the solution that we find. And in a way, if I can again reference Brexit, which I, I won't do a third time, but to say that in these last moments where we are negotiating, uh, it, we will be judged on the capacity of the United Kingdom to move away from its very strong hard lines and to see how the European Union with flexibility and respecting the mandate can also facilitate a compromise. So I hope we're moving back, if you like, or rather forward into a future where compromise is seen as the absolute essential in everything and that we leave behind this world where there is absolutism, where one country wants to be greater than the other. Globally, look at this pandemic. There were great countries that are being devastated by the pandemic, despite their wealth. And I think this should be a wake-up call for all of us to understand that the world is small. And while parts, you know, want to determine their own futures, and indeed a reference to the UK again, that actually none of us are independent. I, I'm from an island, and, and no man is an island. And I think the more we understand our collectiveness in all of this, including climate change, environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, this is universal and we have to find solutions together, not as individuals. Well, I'm sure there's definitely hope so far as Brexit goes that uh, partnerships and friendships can be rebuilt. Uh, you mentioned the coronavirus, of course. We cannot have this conversation without talking about it. And I think even though there is this fragmentation and you need to get people on the same page, where we have seen one voice from the European Union has been over financial measures connected to COVID-19. What has surprised you or uplifted you the most about the response? 
Apologies again, the sound is breaking up, but I, 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 you're asking me about my um, reaction to the response to COVID-19 collectively. I think that is the question. I think initially, um, there was a bit of disbelief when there was, a, uh, if you like, first uh, news about a, a pandemic that would, uh, you know, hit the world, if you like. I think in our initial reaction as, as, as countries, people did what we had to do. Governments led and said we have to clo close down parts of our economy and society, which was deeply upsetting. But people behaved in a proper way and, and this happened and cases came down. At EU level, I think in the beginning, member states were looking inwards, um, but immediately Immediately this was noticed, uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, led by example, and I recall very particularly her apology to our EU citizens in Italy and Spain, who had felt that the European Union initially was not doing enough, and then immediately under her leadership, the member states came together. There was a collective effort to procure uh, protective equipment for the healthcare sector. There's been a huge collective effort around um, finding vaccinations, signing contracts so that we have a supply. But I think more importantly than just looking after ourselves, the European Union is committed to a global effort so that everybody should, be, should have access to a vaccine because until everyone is safe, none of us are safe. And in a way, selfishness has gone out the window here and I hope that the world will learn another lesson from that, that people who are disadvantaged um, should have and must have access to a vaccine to protect their health. I suppose the one uh, hope we have had in recent weeks were the many announcements from um, the pharmaceutical sector from the research institutions of a vaccine and the extraordinary pace in which they developed a vaccination. It leads me to think that if the world put its resources together and had a collective objective around any issue, beating cancer or tackling climate change, we can actually do it. And I think, again, COVID-19 teaches us that, that together you can achieve a great deal by pooling resources, focusing on a problem and learning to solve it. And I suppose our hope going into next year is that there will be an uptake of the vaccination uh, programs and that we will see fewer deaths, fewer cases of uh, the pandemic. But I would also caution by saying that we will not enter uh, the new year on January the 1st, leaving behind the pandemic. It will still be with us. And that's why all of us in our travel, our work, our engagements really cannot celebrate the same way as we might have done in the past, either Christmas or the new year, but maybe celebrate in a way where we are safe to look forward to the middle of perhaps 2021, when we will see the first effects of the vaccination program. So I would just summarize by saying initially there was a you know i think the world got a fright the world got a terrible shock that we could be stopped in our tracks and then there was a sense in which we can deal with this we can deal with it collectively and action was taken collectively and i think that's been a huge tri tribute to uh, both the leadership here and the president of the commission and our member states and speaking of action, uh, let's talk about the fact that our eyes are on this 1.8 trillion euro package. It's the biggest ever financed through the EU budget, helping to rebuild a post-COVID-19 Europe, although we can't really talk about post-COVID-19 just yet, can we? Uh, and then on top of that, there is this digital finance strategy, a sort of digital finance package. That's been based on broad public consultation, digital finance outreach, and that was adopted uh, back in September, I believe, of this year. So lots to look forward to in terms of what you have on your plate. First of all, what is the most surprising aspect of some of those consultations that you learnt about the landscape over, over there? I'm really sorry, but the sound is breaking up. Um, so you've asked me, what is the most surprising aspect of the... The digital finance uh, plan. Okay, well, I suppose it, to put in context, I think, again, because of our experience this year, um, digital finance is almost universal at this stage. So things that we perhaps did not think would happen have happened very rapidly. Um, if you look at how we've all been able to do transactions and why cash is still king, if you like, in the European Union and we want to maintain its availability, we also realize that there are <clears throat> almost generational changes where younger generations are using our smartphones, online transactions very rapidly. What we are doing here in terms of our strategy is to look at instant payments, but to make sure that we um, 
allow this to happen in a safe and secure way. I mean, I think one of the most striking statistics, if I can recall it, um, is that in terms of fraud um, around the whole financial sector, I think it's increased by over 35% because of the pandemic. So while we are looking at digital as being transformative and we are doing everything to make sure it happens, we have to also be concerned about the risks in terms of, um, I suppose, when you make an instant payment, does the money actually transfer? And also for businesses to make sure that if they send goods, that they will get paid for them. But there is no denying that all our work around um, digital, around digital finance, is obviously to make sure that data is used appropriately and, of course, that the customer retains ownership of the data, but that we harvest data in a way to give better services to our citizens to allow them to do business or to do private transactions. Um, it, is, it is quite interesting now that it, those shops that are open are not taking cash, that everything is by card, even for the very smallest amounts. And I mean, that has consequences. So as well as looking at green, we're looking at digital in the financial world. We know, and obviously your audience knows even deeper, the extent of fintechs and what is happening there. A lot of it very exciting, very forward thinking. I suppose from a regulator's perspective, what we need to ensure is that the systems we put in place and the frameworks around legislation um, protect buyer and seller, if you like, protect both sides of this transaction. I think what we want is to support innovation. And again, referring to SMEs, a lot of fintechs come from that school. So help to support innovation, but also to regulate uh, so that it meets the demands and needs of the customer, whoever that might be, business or private. Um, and I think that that is why we have these discussions about policy, which is why our, our colleagues across in the parliament and in member states, we're doing things around making sure that we have more more secure payments, so there will be in the new year the kicking in of a system where customers will have to double authenticate, if you like, their identity, and that is to protect the customer so that others cannot use their identity, which brings us to this wider question on e-identification. And I think all of these things have accelerated because of the pandemic, which has led us all to use technology to a much greater extent. I think it has also um, highlighted where there is a technology gap, where not everyone has access to technology, to simply good broadband. Indeed, I think I'm struggling here in the office of the Commission around sound. So I think there are issues broad broader than just the specifics around finance and digital. But there is no doubt that the future is digital. Um, we need to make sure that digital is also green, but that's perhaps a conversation for another day. Um, and all our efforts here around the work we're doing on cryptocurrencies, crypto assets, is to not allow the evolution of all of these things without us taking sight and taking some ownership and control. Because I think there is too great a risk if we allow that to happen. So our objective and our policy here within the Commission is to be mindful of what's happening and indeed to try and forward gaze so that we prevent problems arising in the future by being proactive in the work that we do. Commissioner McGuinness, you talked about cryptocurrency, but do you feel that uh, European Union citizens are ready? How will you improve digital literacy? Okay, well, you've hit on a subject which is very dear to my heart, which is um, digital literacy and indeed financial literacy. And I think that these topics are essential. Uh, if I get the gist of your question around our future um, digital policy, um, I, I think that it, there are generational issues, but equally, uh, technology is moving so fast. Um, that sometimes it is hard to keep up uh, to speed. I link this with the issue of financial literacy because those who are old enough to remember signing checks, at least when you did that, it was a physical thing you had to do. You had to get a pen, you had to get your checkbook, you make a decision and you sign. Today, I can spend a fortune by a click, sometimes not even a double click. And I think what we need is to make us all, whether you're a private uh, sector or in business, to just think before you click. Um, and that is easier said than done because today we're getting instant news, we're getting instant uh, feed on all sorts of different things. So I think maybe again we've learned that um, uh, there's a time in which to just hold back a little around information. And you know, we're deeply concerned about disinformation that how do we as uh, citizens 
separate the truth from the fiction? How do we as citizens use digital finance, digital technologies to benefit us uh, while uh, mitigating the risks that are involved in it? And the longer you, you think about these things, the more difficult they are. They're really, really challenging. But it is the, I suppose it is our mantra here, it is our duty in the Commission to make sure that our legislation and our proposal tackle these very issues. And that also through my work in terms of outreach with citizens and organisations, that I talk about these issues so that they too can and will be prepared for this enormous change that is coming. And on the generational point, lastly, are we were concerned around an older generation that might feel removed because of all of this development. Sometimes I think around trying to get service on mobile phones and trying to make contact with a person is really difficult. And maybe I think we need to question that, you know, because we can all call phone lines and helplines, but sometimes it's hard to get answers to our specific questions. And I think when we get over this very hasty part of digital, we will perhaps look at service as being equally important as speed. Uh, but again, those are issues that will preoccupy us for, for some time to come. What would you say to any SMEs that are still resistant about adopting, you know, digital financial technologies just because okay. there is that lack of education? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really big issue. And the most important thing for SMEs is to understand that even um, at member state level, but at European Union level, there, is, there are really big supports to help SMEs, to help small shops, retailers who've been decimated by this crisis to put their goods online and to provide their services online. And I see this happening throughout our towns and villages across the European Union. Because the question we all have to ask ourselves is, Will we go back to the normal that persisted in the early part of 2021? And I think none of us believe we will fully revert. Maybe we shouldn't. Uh, but we then have to see what will the landscape look like for society, because as much as we're talking about finance and SMEs, these are vital, but also society has an interest in having a community that is engaged and can have a, a life that is, if you like, supportive of each other. So my big um, ask to SMEs in Europe and elsewhere is to not be fearful of the digital transformation. There are supports there, both within your member state, in the case of the European Union, and here at Commission level. There are organisations that support SMEs. And, and sometimes I, I think that people see Europe as having a few large companies, but actually, the lifeblood of the European Union are SMEs. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Uh, they do incredible work. And sometimes because they do incredible work, they get overlooked. But I have al also been contacted by SMEs who are fearful of the digital future because they're not ready. And therefore, we have a quantum leap to make to allow them and to facilitate them in their preparation. And I think what's been very reassuring from my side as I watch this landscape evolve is that SMEs themselves are reaching out and looking for support because I think many of them realize that if they don't, they will be left behind. I mean, we are concerned about the um, impact of online shopping if it keeps continuing at this level where it excludes SMEs. And I think that therefore we do need a level playing field so that SMEs are part of and on these platforms and not feel excluded from them. Now, I don't underestimate the task that lies ahead. It is significant. But the opportunities are also there. So while I have some concerns about some SMEs being fearful, as you say, perhaps they don't fully understand, there is expertise there. Uh, you can get the support. And I would urge all SMEs to reach out for support and not expect the world of the future to be what it was in the start of 2020. None of us think that that will be the case and therefore prepare for this change and reap the benefits of it. Well, certainly there is also concern about cybersecurity, isn't there, about the idea that uh, it's costly. How do you make sure that you have a, a risk compliance yeah. officer that you can afford? These sorts of really practical questions. But there is going to be a new cyber resilience framework for financial services, isn't there? Sorry, again, the sound of cyber, cyber resilience and cyber security, which you've raised there, is a hugely significant issue. Um, because in all our, whether we're large or small, we have to protect ourselves from attack. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a fundamental issue here within the institution 
within the institutions, but also across the union generally. So it is something that we are very conscious of. It is an, an area of expertise. And I suppose sometimes the difficulty for us is that those who are minded to attack us from a cyber point of view are sometimes streets ahead in terms of the, the techniques they use, and we have to be up to the same level of speed. There is obviously additional costs involved in having to make sure that everything is secure, particularly online payments. But equally, and I would repeat the point that, uh, you know, at least there is information there, there is support there. But I don't underestimate the challenge behind your question. And to say that here at commission level, it is our duty to make sure that the framework exists around uh, this cybersecurity issue and that we provide the necessary, um, if you like, support, but also infrastructure around security. And one of the things that this commission speaks of is, you know, that we are a geopolitical commission. And I think for the world in general, the issue of cybersecurity is enormous. We know that uh, in the past, the, the weapons of war may have been physical weapons. I think in the future, we will understand that economies, um, institutions, businesses can literally be ground to a halt through cyber attacks. So they're very much ever present in our minds as we look to this more digital future and something that we are increasingly working harder and harder on to find solutions, to work with businesses, to protect ourselves and our institutions. So given that we have that in mind, uh, there was a question raised earlier on the FinTech Festival today uh, around a digital euro. So as we just narrow the focus a little bit on the eurozone, what's your feeling okay, about this? So the digital euro has been spoken about a lot this last year. Um, essentially, we have the European Central Bank already looking into it in, in all its details, trying to understand um, how it might be structured, what are the um, opportunities around digital euro, what are the potential threats around a digital euro. We know that other central banks globally are looking at this. And we also know that there are private operators looking at digital currencies. So at the moment, what we're saying here in the European Union, we are investigating this to see its potential. I think amongst our member states, some are really, you know, looking forward to and pushing for more rapid action around a digital euro. I think the pace we've set ourselves is perhaps the right one, so that by the middle of next year, there will be more information about uh, how a digital euro could be structured, what are the consequences, implications, etc., of a digital euro, um, also on our banking sector or what might the consequences be, and then a decision will be taken. The impression I get from uh, the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, is that they are cautious but very careful, and that if we were not looking into a digital euro, that would not be healthy. So I think we are very minded of our responsibility to look at how this might uh, evolve into the future. The Commission here are working with uh, the Central Bank, and our member states are also asking us to develop this more and explain how it might prevail. But I don't think we have yet come to a final decision that will be later. We also need to understand or, or try to what it would mean for individuals, um, for businesses. And I think there are many advantages. And given that we've been talking for some time here about digital, and this is a, a fintech event, I, I think it is inevitable that we move towards a digital euro and that it will have you know, consequences for transactions um, and whether we need as many different stages in the whole transaction process. So at this stage, I can definitely confirm that the European Union uh, is looking at this. We are guided by the European Central Bank and experts there. And I think we will look forward to 2021 as perhaps a decision-making time. But even if a decision is made, it doesn't happen overnight. I know there are other jurisdictions that are testing a digital currency, and it is not plain sailing. So whatever we do will be done at a pace that makes sure that it will be a sustainable development rather than rush something that might, if you like, end up with significant problems when we see it rolled out. But it is very much front and centre here in our discussions. Well, I'm glad you talked about it as a sustainable development, because I actually want to talk about sustainability now. How do we leverage fintech in the European Union uh, for SMEs to get to a greener future? 
Okay, look, um, again, I'm hearing sustainable, I'm hearing SMEs, I'm hearing fintech. So one of the, I think, extraordinary developments, but necessary ones, is that the financial sector is now almost central to sustainability on two levels. Firstly, companies are being asked to explain what they're doing, not just their profit and loss, but explain what they're doing and their impact on the environment, on climate change, again, in the future, perhaps around um, biodiversity. So at one level, that's there. Then you have investors, asset managers, individuals who are concerned about risk to the financial system and to companies that they want to invest in. They need information about the impact that the company is having on climate so that they can factor in the risk. And when fintechs are brought into the equation, of course, it's access to services and access to finance. So for me on my agenda early next year, sustainable finance is a big, big issue. And we are having a lot of debate here and framing that policy because we know that if we don't get the financial system focused on sustainability, then it won't happen. But we also know, and this is the starting point for me, as a parliamentarian and prior to coming to the Commission here, I was one of the negotiators on the European climate law, which is still going through the process. And the European Parliament voted to increase our ambitions, reducing emissions by 2030 compared to 1990 by 60%. At the moment, it's just 40%. We are all committed to climate neutrality by 2050. So once you start at that point, you realize that everything has to change along the way, that we have to stop finance flowing to projects and enterprises that do harm to the climate and encourage investment into projects and uh, enterprises that are positive for the environment. So the obvious ones are around renewable energy, whether that's sun or wind or whatever. Um, then we have to look at our food supply chain to see what areas we could make more sustainable into the future. And in finance, it's quite interesting. We will be having our discussion on how we review the non-financial reporting directive here. And ultimately, our goal is to make sure that we put the profits of a company on the same and rather raise to that level, uh, the issues around non-financial uh, reporting so that investors, be they big or small, can see what a company is doing in terms of sustainability and see does that match with their requirements. One of the things we have done already um, is called a taxonomy. So we had our experts and scientists gathered from uh, across Europe look at identifying enterprises and projects that are green, if you like, that meet sustainability criteria. What we're doing now in this number of weeks is reaching out for public consultation to see what stakeholders think of this taxonomy as to how we might implement it. And look, we have debates between some who want absolute green projects only. We have others who say, look, we want to be green. You have to help us transition. And maybe this is to the point of your question. We need to finance the transition. And that is something that, therefore, in, information is key. So when a, a large or small business is moving towards more sustainability, they can then approach for finance to help them reach those targets. And while it's a very exciting time and a very challenging time, I think it it's also can be difficult for companies to understand all of these requirements. I would say when it comes to SMEs, we are very clearly of the view not to overburden SMEs with bureaucracy and that we might, in some um, sectors of enterprise, very large companies have mandatory requirements. We could, for SMEs, uh, when we come to making our decision, leave those requirements as voluntary so that those SMEs who see a value in making these voluntary declarations around uh, financing their enterprises can choose to do that. So the landscape at the moment, um, we can see the end game. We can see the end of this uh, project, if you like, towards climate neutrality. Uh, but I think it's, it's going to become more complex when we talk about other issues. I mentioned environmental degradation and biodiversity. We also will be looking at having a taxonomy that deals with water and water resources. Huge global issue, a big issue within the European Union. Ultimately, though, we're not just talking about the environment, the E in ESG. We are going to look in the European Union around social and governance. And companies will also be asked to report on those issues, not immediately, but certainly into the future, because they are being demanded by investors and by citizens. 
How, Commissioner McGuinness, have you thought about sharing information that you glean from that journey, the sustainability journey, with other nations? What sort of collaborations and conversations have you had? I think that's an absolutely key question because I mentioned in previous items as we discussed that no country, no entity on their own can make the level of progress we need. So we do need a global effort. And I'm very proud to say that the European Union was instrumental in setting up the international platform on sustainable finance. And we have many major countries involved in that. Um, so we work at the international level. Um, I have lots of conversations with regulators globally who are looking at sustainability and the message I give to them is that the European Union wants global action and therefore we support at every level global standards however given our system here and demands of citizens and our politicians we believe that Europe needs to move further and faster we don't abandon the world and its standards we take them on board but where we see an opportunity to do more and better we take that leap and to some extent uh, my global partners have said we appreciate what Europe does because it's, in some ways Europe puts itself under pressure, but we also put the rest of the world under pressure to move so that companies that are global and operate in the European Union will have to meet our standards, which in a way drags, if you like, uh, their subsidiaries elsewhere to meet those same standards. So yes, uh, talking with, engaging on with the world on climate change is essential. If we were the only block of countries doing anything around climate, we will not make the impact that's needed. And I suppose one of the things I hope will emerge post-pandemic is that sense of global unity. And also that the developed world really does owe it to the developing world where there are many more cases of um, you know, terrible uh, weather events and catastrophes and crop collapses. Um, these are all caused by climate change, caused by the way we have lived and worked. And therefore, when we make change it is to acknowledge that we have a duty and a responsibility to make um, the world more sustainable, to hand on to the next generation a planet that is in better shape. Um, and I, I think one of the most interesting things for me during the, the first lockdown, if you like, was people got more in tune with nature because I think we all slowed down and people were walking because they weren't driving anywhere. And in a sense, I, I, I got a feeling that people were more tuned in then to what lies ahead, both the threat if we don't take action and the opportunities if we do. So we see here in Europe for our recovery, green and digital. The money that um, we've referenced in relation to the future European budget and the uh, borrowing that the Commission will do, this vast sum of money, 750 billion euro to re, if you like, boot the European economy, is not for the old economy, it's to create a new economy. And there will be job creation out of that, there will be new skills required. Now what we need to do is to make sure that those who lose out in the current situation adopt and are given an opportunity to develop the skills to move towards this green and digital economy that we are building. And that's a challenge for the educational system, um, not just in Europe, but elsewhere. But it's a huge opportunity as well. And I think for the first time in decades, where we have talked before about climate change, as a journalist, I would have reported many, many years ago on it. I think now it is front and centre. Nobody is, is, well, some do deny, but most people understand what's happening. They see it around them. They're concerned about their children and their grandchildren children and therefore we have great societal buy-in to this change not uh, forgetting those that will be impacted and who might lose their jobs I mean if you talk to people who sell coal coal men these are not people who make a fortune they they actually very often their fuel is bought by the poorest who can't afford uh, more if you like other systems so we need to make, bring everyone with us nobody can be left behind and I think if we do leave people behind there will be a societal backlash if you like so certainly from with my political antenna on here, we have to manage this transition to be an inclusive one. Certainly, and speaking of inclusivity, uh, let's just get back to those SMEs again, because there are some SMEs that would have gone out of business during this pandemic, and those businesses may never come back. What do we do about that? Okay, well, that's a, that is a huge question, but it speaks to the truth, because we know that um, in, in two ways. One, there are businesses that will not be the same again, and that the old business model is redundant, and therefore it's gone. There needs to be a, a new business model put in place. 
At a second level, we have some sectors like tourism, um, retail, that have been so impacted by the shutdown that even if they are viable in the long term, they have vulnerabilities in the short term. One of the things I'm currently on my desk here is a strategy uh, for banks to deal with non-performing loans. Now, the good news is that this crisis, our banks were part of a solution because the previous crisis, which was devastating across the world and in Europe, the banks were part of the problem, but we regulated them better. They were better capitalized going into this crisis. And through flexibilities and changes we made around um, rules, they were able to continue and are continuing to lend, both to SMEs. Because at the moment, what we are doing, both at EU level in the banking system and at member state level, we are keeping people connected to their workplace. We are keeping businesses afloat. But we know that there will be a time when some of these supports will have to be fall away, if you like, hopefully not in a dramatic cliff edge way, but they will be removed. And therefore, then there will be a testing time. So individual enterprises, as you say, that will not survive. And if they have loans, this is an issue for the financial system to work towards resolving. And then for the businesses themselves, I mean, I would be very sensitive to how harsh this transition has been, that there were very profitable businesses who, through no fault of their own, have been decimated by a pandemic and know that they cannot recover, at least in the medium term. And I think we will need to see how member states and banks in member states cope with that reality, deal with non-performing loans in a sensitive way, but we also need to make sure that the financial system doesn't again become bogged down, balance sheets overloaded with non-performing loans, and then governments having to support banks. What is interesting at the moment is that member states are and rightly supporting SMEs because these are the lifeblood, as I've said, of our economy. Uh, we want to make sure that when we uh, get to a stage where the pandemic is no more, that we secure as many SMEs, secure as many jobs as practicable, or rebuild enterprises with a more digital orientation. And therefore, it is really important for us to be aware of what lies ahead. And that's why at the end of this year, this month, in fact, I will be unveiling this strategy so that people can plan. And equally, I mean, it's also true, it's very simple advice that I would always urge SMEs where there is a sense of that the future is not going to be good to be in touch with your financial provider, because very often these problems, if dealt with early, can be dealt with effectively. But, you know, I do reflect a lot on the difference between this crisis and the past one. Perhaps the monies are the same. You can talk about it financially and the impact, but the origins of it are very, very different. I also think that societies across the world and in Europe, we've been battered by restrictions. There's been a terrible invasion of people's normal lives. I think of older people who are not getting visitors in care homes. I think the societal impact of this pandemic will have to be taken account of as we deal with the hard facts of our economies and our banking system. Not easy to reconcile, but I think we have to try and do that. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of airline pilots, many of them who would have been in my constituents and who would have good salaries and would have borrowings to meet those salaries, who never envisaged that the airline would stop flying for months and months and have no sense of it recovering, at least in the short to medium term. I mean, they have financial difficulties that they never thought would darken their doorstep. Equally, we have vulnerable uh, communities for whom this pandemic is really, really difficult um, and need more support than ever. Um, and, and again, to go back to a point that we spoke about earlier on financial literacy, some of the research we have here in Europe would point to a significant uh, part of our society really not being able to deal with an economic shock um, or an unforeseen event, let alone a pandemic. So we have these vulnerabilities to manage uh, with all its complexity as we face into 2021. And speaking, of course, of financial services, it, it can be uh, a huge worry. If you look at the IMF statistics, we know that in developed economies, debt is running at more than 100% of GDP. I mean, does that keep you up at night? 
Well, it, it does, because as I reflected to you earlier, um, there is no magical solution to this, but we are dealing with, with uh, a, a problem from a different source, if you like. Sometimes in the past, it was easy to, you know, blame reckless banks and borrowers that weren't taking account of their repayment capacity, and some of that was valid. On the other hand, in this pandemic, we, in fact, were in Europe recovering. We were seeing um, unemployment levels uh, fall. We were seeing businesses thrive. And then something outside of our control, because we didn't plan for it, has literally taken the wind from our sails. Um, so you are right in pointing to the hard economics. I mean, governments are borrowing way beyond what their budgets forecast had predicted. But it was essential that they do it, because not to do that, there would have been an economic collapse and a societal impact of such proportions as you would worry for the future of stability in our communities. So I think that we have taken the right steps, both central banks uh, and um, governments. And I think now the challenge is to manage the transition as we recover um, and not to, if you like, announce one day to the next that the supports are being reduced um, immediately or removed immediately, but rather to do it in a planned way. It is also true that if you look at the supports coming in to, um, uh, from central banks, member states, indirectly to businesses and SMEs is supporting the banking system. So um, it's an intricate story, but you did ask if I stay awake at night. Um, I try to sleep well because I think you make better decisions if you do, but there are times when the enormity of what we are facing, you know, it is quite serious. On the other hand, and, you know, to some extent I say it to myself, um, politically, we were not prepared for a pandemic. In one sense, that is outrageous, that we were not prepared. Uh, politically, in many countries, uh, there was a reluctance to fund public health systems so that we had very few uh, intensive care beds when this pandemic hit us. That wasn't very wise. So, you know, sometimes things happen to really wake up the consciousness of societies and the political um, bodies that uh, manage and control. And the one lesson we will take from this is that health is your wealth, that actually nothing else matters. And if there's ill health at the level of the pandemic, economies don't count because they have to shut down. So, look, my hope would be that the learnings from this crisis, difficult as they have been, and I acknowledge with great sadness the many, many listening to this who would have lost family and friends from this pandemic, from very young to very older age groups, that we will never face this again, that the world will realize that um, you need to be prepared for the most unexpected. And we are able to show that you know, when it came to finding a solution by way of a vaccination, that we, we were up to the challenge. So it's been, I mean, 2020, I think when we look back, even in 10 years' time, if we're all around, we will look back and say, wow, that was a real wake-up moment for the world, a real wake-up moment for the developed world, particularly, who should have been better prepared, and we're not. We are going to see in the short term uh, the state being bigger in most countries than it was before the pandemic because of the need for public uh, financing. There was even a discussion in one member state around the basic income concept, particularly for arts and culture, because this area of society has been devastated. Theatres, cinemas, you know, the normal, I mean, uh, uh, galleries, museums have been reduced to zero because of public contact being unable to happen due to the pandemic. And, you know, the idea of a basic income has been mentioned before. It's interesting that it's come back in again in a specific sector. So, uh, you know, it's hard to see what will emerge when we are coming out of the recovery phase, which is really only just beginning. And I suppose a word of caution to all of us, and I think we're mindful of this, that at the moment restrictions are being eased uh, across certainly the European Union. There will be festivities to be had, and we're all saying to each other, look, we can't celebrate in the way we normally would, um, and we just need to be mindful that if we celebrate as we normally would, then we could have a very, very, if you like, spike in cases of um, COVID-19 in the new year. And none of us want to see that while not wanting to be a spoil sport. But, you know, uh, this pandemic touches everyone. It's Wealthy, certain. poor, ill, healthy. Everyone has been impacted by this, um, and we should learn from it and not forget um, what we have gone through. And I think the core for me, if, if Europe 
and it is showing leadership, is to make sure that everybody is involved globally in this vaccination programme and that there is no sense in which those who are rushing to be there first and to, you know, wanting to be out of the traps, forget yep. about those who are not even there. Thank you so much for those words. We're going to wrap up there, but I think the biggest, the biggest thing I want to leave that with is your comment about health is your wealth. This has been a massive learning point, hasn't it? Uh, Commissioner Absolutely. Mareed McGuinness, uh, the European Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, I wish you the best of luck. This has been a wonderful conversation. I can't thank you enough. Thanks so much. Well, well, thank you so much. And honestly, it's been a little stressful my end because the sound wasn't perfect. But look, we managed to communicate, with, which is all for the better. And I wish you the very best of luck and to everyone who's tuning in and good health. Absolutely. Absolutely. You did really well, even with the sound difficulties. OK, we will leave that conversation there. Uh, that was the EU Commissioner for Financial Services, Financial Stability and Capital Markets Union, Commissioner Mareed McGuinness. What a wonderful conversation. OK, well, it's time to move on to the next of our firesides that's coming up in just a moment.